Welcome to VLSI Point. This is your one and only VLSI Shweta and today we will see the another video of very long interview question playlist. I have received multiple comments from your side that this playlist is very much helpful. It is helping in our interview preparation. So yes, I have decided to continue this playlist and provide more and more questions that can help you in your interviews. Starting with the first question. What does it mean to infer latches and how can you prevent them? So the term infer latches typically refers to the unintended synthesis of latches in digital circuit design. Latches are sequential logic elements that store information temporarily and are generally not desired in case of combinational circuits. Inferred latches occurs when the synthesis tool infers latches instead of the intended behavior and usually due to the incomplete or ambiguous design specification. Here you can see in this code always add S1, S0, I0, I1, I2 and I3. So what code we have written here in begin end we have given the case statement on S0 and S1. So two bits are there that means four possible combinations should be there but here we have written only three. 2 tick B 0, 1 and 2 and the output is out equals to I0, I1 and I2 respectively. One thing you can notice here, in case of four possible combinations, we have written here only three. So whenever it comes to the simulation part, the simulator will get confused here that what to do in case of the fourth possible combination. If it occurs, what the simulation will do? So in that scenario, a latch will infer. Keep one thing in your mind, whenever you write the code, just try to mention all the possible combination or in simple words, do not confuse your simulator. In digital circuit design, the preferred behavior is usually defined in terms of flip-flops, which are synchronous sequential elements. Flip-flops provide better control over the timing and the behavior of the circuit. When latches are inferred, it can lead to the timing issues, increased power consumption and potential functional errors in the design. So that should not happen. So one thing you can do whenever you are writing the case statement or the FL statement, just mention all the possible combination and don't skip any of that. Otherwise, a latch will infer and your circuit will not perform according to your expectation. So this is how you can avoid inferring latches. Other guidelines are also there how you can prevent uh, inferring the latches like you can ensure the complete and unambiguous design specification. You can use synchronous design practice. Also, you should avoid the unintentional level sensitive behavior. You should verify and simulate the design. Also, you should consult synthesis tool documentation. These all are the possibilities how you can avoid these things. But the very simple answer is whenever you are writing the code, keep it very simple and clean and don't confuse your simulator. Write all the possible combination. It would be a good practice if you will mention a default statement. If you are mentioning the default statement, there will be no inferring of latches. I hope it is clear to you. Coming to the next question, write a very long code for synchronous and asynchronous reset. So in our previous video also, we have discussed about the synchronous and asynchronous reset in detail. What is the meaning, how they will work? In this question, we will see how you can write the code. So in case of synchronous reset, obviously the reset is synchronized with the clock signal. That means reset is dependent on the clock and hence it should be present in the sensitivity list. However, in case of asynchronous reset, the reset signal is independent of the clock signal. It is not depending on the clock. So it should be present in the sensitivity list. In case of synchronous, simply you should write always at pause edge clock and then begin in your commands. However, in case of asynchronous reset, you have to write always at pause edge clock or neg edge reset and then you can give the command begin end and then FLs. Coming to the next question, what does tick time scale 1 nanosecond slash 1 picosecond signify in the Verilog code? So in Verilog, tick time scale is a compiler directive which specifies the time unit which is used in the simulation of the design. The tick time scale directive is typically placed at the beginning of the Verilog file and has the following syntax. Tick time scale, time unit slash time precision. Here in this case, we have written tick time scale 1 nanosecond slash 1 picosecond. So 1 
nanosecond is the time unit here and 1 picosecond is the time precision. So the time unit represents the basic time increment used in the simulation. It determines the duration of each time step in the simulation. In this case, 1 nanosecond means that each time step represents 1 nanosecond of the simulation time. The time precision represents the smallest time resolution used in the simulation. It determines the accuracy with which time values are represented. In this case, 1 picosecond means that the simulation can represent time values with a precision of 1 picosecond. I hope it is clear to you. Coming to the next question, write a very long code for an 8-bit shift left register with a positive edge clock, asynchronous clear, serial in and serial out. So this is a very good question and see how you can write the code here. So simply module then your module name clock clear s in and s out so define all your input and output signals and we are also taking here a temporary register of 8 bit then always add pause edge clock or pause edge clear why we are mentioning here pause edge clear also in the sensitivity list because in question it is mentioned that the clear is asynchronous signal already in previous question i have mentioned how to deal with an asynchronous signal so we have applied that only then in begin end, we have written if clear, then 8 tick B0 will be given to this temp register. Otherwise, temp 6 down to 0, comma S in is given to the temp register. Now, see what is happening here in case of 8 bit shift left register. How it will work? The 8 bit data will shift towards the left side one by one, and the output will be nothing but the leftmost bit of the register. So, this is the reason why we are assigning this temp 7 to the S out that will be our final output and the previous line where we have assigning this temp 6 down to 0 comma s in what is the meaning of this line these curly braces are representing the concatenation operator and we are concatenating two values s in is given from the right side and the remaining 7 bit data of the temporary register so whenever the clear signal will be low that time this shift will happen and the values will be assigned to the temp register and this temp register will be and this temp register values will be given to our final output signal that is S out. So this is how your 8 bit shift left register will work. Next question is write a very long code for 4 cross 1 mux of 1 bit using case statement. So see the code here module mux A, B, C, D these are 4 inputs select line and then the output. Always at A, B, C, D or select then we have given a case statement here 2 tick B 00011011 because the select line is of 2 bits and the output given here is out equals to A, B, C, D respectively. Also, we have given a default statement also just to avoid inferring any kind of latches here. So, this is a very good practice. Actually, this line is optional in case of a combinational circuit. But whenever you write a code, just try to mention this default statement in order to avoid any kind of inference of latches. So, this is how you can write a code for 4 cross 1 multiplexer. Coming to the next question, write a very low code for 120 megahertz to 30 megahertz frequency divider. This is a very good question and it could be asked in your interviews and your written exams as well. So what you have to do here, see the two values 120 megahertz to 30 megahertz. That means how much is the difference? 120 divided by 30 that is 4. So it is nothing but a frequency divider by 4. You have to design that circuit. Now remember your third semester of BTEC when you have just started learning the digital electronics. So there you have learned one thing that a flip-flop acts as a divide by 2 circuit. So see the explanation here also that basically it is a frequency divider by 4 and by 4 means you can use here 2 flip flops. One flip flop will divide by 2 another one will again divide by 2 so total divide by 4 circuit will occur. So we need 2 flip flops here and 2 flip flops means 4 possible combinations 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0 and 1, 1. So see how you can write the code module then the module name input clock output reg output. Then we have taken a reg type counter value variable of 2 bits. Always at pause edge clock, then in begin end, if counter equals to 2 tick B 1 1. That means if the counter reaches to the maximum value, then again allot the initial value that is 0 0 to the counter and negation of output will be given to the output. Why we are giving the negation value? Because we need to invert the output at every 4 clock cycle. Then only your circuit will behave as a divide by 4 circuit. That is frequency divider by 4. In else statement, we have given given counter plus 1 is assigning 
to the counter value so simply here the meaning is whenever your counter reaches to the maximum value just assign 00 value to the counter and negate the output so again it will start counting till 4 if your counter doesn't reaches to the maximum value just keep on increasing the counter value so this is how you can implement a frequency divider by 4 suppose in exam it will ask to design a frequency divider by 8 so what will you do in that condition so frequency divider by 8 means what you need to take three flip-flops here divide by 2 divide by 2 divide by 2 so total divide by 8 circuit will you get so three flip-flops means total eight possible combinations from 0 0 0 to 1 1 1 so in that condition you need to take three bit counters and code will be same only just you have to change the values so guys definitely you should try to write the code for a frequency divider by 8 and if you face any problem do let me know in the comment box it will be a very good practice for you Coming to the next question, how many initial blocks can a module have and how will they be executing? So in Verilog, a module can have multiple initial blocks. The initial block is used to define the initial condition or behavior of a signal in a simulation. It is executed only once at the beginning of the simulation. Multiple initial blocks with a module are executed sequentially in the order they appear in the code. The execution of the initial blocks follows a top-down approach where the initial blocks are executed one after another starting from the first initial block defined in the module. So I hope this theory concept is clear to you. So this is it guys. This is about today's video. If you find it useful, like this video and subscribe BLSI Point. Recently, I have started my another YouTube channel that is Electronic Trails. This YouTube channel is especially for all those students who are beginner, who are new to electronic fields. This channel will be very much helpful for you to guide them what is electronics engineering, how they can make their career, how they can utilize the four years of engineering and pursue a good internship a good job in this electronics field so do subscribe electronic trails also and share with your cousins and juniors i hope you have joined our community vlsi point on telegram this is it guys this is about today's video we will meet soon in the next video thanks for watching